Uh, last couple of people to sit down. My name is Mike Burrows. Um, this is my very first time in India. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, I won't give myself a long introduction uh, just for now. Um, there's a couple of bits of information up on the screen here. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about me and what I've done over the course of the presentation. I'm going to start with two statements. You could call them assertions. I'm not going to um, justify them now. I'll just make them. I'm going to hope that by the end of the presentation, uh, you'll have some sympathy, uh, some belief, some justification in what I'm saying. And the first one is, can man is the humane, start with what you do now, approach to change. Um, the start with what you do now piece, you'll see in just a few moments. Whether it's humane or not, you can judge for yourself. The second assertion, it's quite a strong one, is that Kanban has always scaled, that it's always been about scale, in fact. Um, got a picture here with 50 people in the room. Um, that's our friend uh, Dan Vacanti on the left. And behind him on the wall, you can't see it, is about $2 million worth of work, um, part of a $12, $15 um, million project. And the title of the book as well, uh, Kanban, Successful Evolutionary Change for Your Technology Business. I just want to emphasize that for your technology business part of that. Now in the book, um, David didn't spend a lot of time explaining exactly how to go about making Kanban or Agile scale in your organization. But that is the context to the book. And some of this you have to work out for yourself. Um, some of this David and his colleagues, I'm one of them, um, other people in the community have helped to put into words over the last um, couple of years a bit more about how it actually works, uh, ways of explaining it, ways of teaching it, and so on. So that's why I'm here. So the question is how. And the way we're going to do this is by li is running a little exercise. Um, can we use the, um, one of the roving mics? Oh, excuse me, audio guys. Can we use one of those roving microphones, please? So what we're going to do is do a like five or ten minute version of an exercise uh, that you can download and run with your teams for something like 45 minutes. Done properly, it's a reflective thing. We're doing it very, very quickly. This is a super, super quick version. Just going to be a bit of fun. Um, just understanding how Kanban's values were abstracted from uh, the principles and practices of the method. Do we have a microphone that works? We do. Brilliant. Right. So here's the test. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to read this from the back, but at the bottom of the screen, we have nine values. Now, they're in a randomized order, not the order that I normally remember, remember them in, so I'm going to have to read them off the screen. Customer focus, agreement, collaboration, flow, leadership, transparency, understanding, respect, and balance. Now, I'd be surprised if there's a single word in there, or perhaps customer focus. I don't know if that's been mentioned today, but... Um, very few of these things um, haven't already been mentioned today as values that many of us recognize and share. What we're going to do is to see how four of these nine map to the foundational principles of the, of the Kanban method. Now, there's a trick here, and the trick is to work from bottom to top, because the, the top one is the hardest one. So if we leave the hardest one till last, we'll have fewer, uh, fewer, fewer items to choose from. So who'd like to make a guess at uh, which value goes with Encourage acts of leadership at all levels in your organization from individual contributors to senior management. Right, we've had a few shouted out. Do we have the microphone? Put your hand up if you have an idea what it might be. Quick show of hands. A couple of people over here. Collaboration. Collaboration could be one. Let's have another try. No wrong answers here, by the way, but there's, there is a canonical answer. Let's put it like that. Transparency. Transparency. Transparency could be. So I go through the list once more. Customer focus, agreement, collaboration, flow, leadership, transparency, understanding, respect, and balance. Respect. I hear leadership from over here. So that is the canonical answer. I won't say the right answer. So next one, initially, respect, initial roles, responsibilities, and job titles. Respect, got it in one. Now, we're not evil. You know, the, if the clue is in the question, you've probably got the right answer. Um, agree to pursue evolutionary change. I think I hear a consensus, but let's hear it from the microphone. 
Agreement. Agreement. Got it. Right. Now, this is the hard one. Now, this is um, one of the most interesting and powerful principles of the Kanban method. Start with what you do now. I hear lots of answers shouted out. So this is clearly a controversial one. Let's have some hands up. Right, let's, uh, let's, let's hear some answers. Flow. Flow, okay, that's a good answer. Let's hear some more. Understanding. Understanding, very good answer. I'll hear us have one more. You'll hear that I like threes. Customer focus. Customer focus. Right, it was actually the middle one of those three was, was the canonical answer, understanding. So first four principles, first four values, sorry, of Kanban, understanding, agreement, respect, and leadership. Now, it gets a little harder. We've got some core practices, and we've got six remaining values left for four core practices. And what's more, one of the practices is two values against them. What, what the, the long and short of it is that one of, the, one of the values here is going to occur three times. So we can't just cross them off when we've used them. But again, to make it easy, we'll start from the bottom. We'll start with the, with the more obvious ones. So the first one, the one I can never say, because I can never say the second word, improve collaboratively, evolve experimentally. Right, everyone's shouting out collaboration. Good, got it in one. Uh, straight out of the Agile Manifesto. Next one, implement feedback loops. Right, so I'll, I'll read out the possibilities again. Customer focus, collaboration, flow, transparency, and balance. I've heard customer focus. Can I hear another one? Transparency is the canonical answer. Right, um, make policies explicit. Transparency again. Right, so we've got one that's occurs twice. Where else do you think transparency belongs? Do you think it belongs with visualize, limit work in progress, or with manage flow? Visualize. visualize. Right, we're going to get at this. Right, manage flow. There's an easy one and a hard one. Now, what's the easy one? Flow. Good, we don't need the microphone for that one. It's flow. Right, the harder one that goes with manage flow. We've got two choices now. It's between customer focus and balance. Customer focus, good. So flow is about flow through. It's also about what you flow to, and we flow to the customer. Right, last one. Limit work in progress can only be balance. Good. So well, if it's not obvious what some of these mean, we'll explore these in a minute. But first, I just want to ask you just to pause for a moment. So of the nine, which of those resonate with you most strongly? You might even want to write these down. You, you, you may find it useful in a moment if you do. So which three resonate with you personally out of customer focus, agreement, collaboration, flow, leadership, transparency, understanding, respect, and balance? And again, this is a hard question because you don't know exactly how some of these may work. But which, ones, which of these might speak into your work situation? What, which ones do you think... Yes, this is exactly how our, our, how our organization works, or gosh, our organization really needs some more of this, and we'd be so much better off if we had it. So again, another three. So again, you may find it helpful to write those down. So I mentioned there's a longer version of this exercise, much more reflective, much more discussion, and I found that teams very often spend 45 minutes or even longer on this exercise. Um, we've made it uh, freely available. You can just download it from that link there. I also put a little website um, to first expose some of the ideas in this talk. It's called meldstrong.com. You can create a profile there and put your three values in there. Uh, those will then link through to the pages that describe um, how those values work. So I asked you to do things in groups of three. And actually find there's some groups of three that work really well in explaining how Kanban works. Um, so the first three, transparency, balance, and collaboration. Um, now, for months, I've been describing it in those terms, but not having a good name for them. And we've come up with a good name, sustainability. And I think that's a, a, something that will uh, be familiar to you um, in the Agile community, Agile teams, the idea of sustainable pace, for example, the idea of Agile practices bringing, trans bringing sustainability to a team. The next three are customer focus, flow, and leadership, and they go with a name we call service orientation. And the last three, understanding, agreement, and respect, 
and they're about survivability. Now, it, may, it might be hard to see the relationship between those three and survivability, but we'll explore those at the end. Excuse me. So let's see how those first three work. Sustainability, transparency, balance, and collaboration. So transparency is clearly a very important value in, in Kanban. Kanban, you know, based on the idea of visual management, for example, uh, we saw um, three of the practices that were based on transparency. Visualize, make policies explicit, implement feedback loops. And the key idea is a very simple, very beautiful one, really. Um, organize the work in such a way that people can self-organize around, self around it more effectively. Um, there's a bit of an anti-pattern with Kanban. Occasionally, you'll see boards that try to organize people. Um, you know, this person can only do this kind of work, for example. Um, that is an anti-pattern. That's against, you know, common agile practices like swarming. It's against self-organization. Self-organization isn't just about organizing yourself in a self-managing way. It's about the system being able to reconfigure itself. Uh, and that's something we can do from day to day around the work. Or we may actually decide that actually going forward, we want to organize, oursel organize ourselves in a different way. We've captured some learning about the way the work should work. And we can capture that learning visually in the design of the board. We can capture it in, in the form of written policies, things like definitions of done, quality criteria, prioritization and scheduling rules, and so on. So it's all transparency, making things more explicit so they're open to challenge, open to change. And feedback loops. I've mentioned this, this particular stand-up meeting already. 50 people in the room, $2 million worth of uh, work on the board. Um, David Anderson, the author of the book, is actually standing out in the corridor on the right. Um, and this, you know, this is a daily stand-up meeting that can, in 15 minutes can go through the issues of a $15 million project. Balance. So the first part of balance is about pull systems, um, systems where we deliberately limit the work in progress to improve the flow of work. What this is doing is balancing the work that needs to be done or the work that's currently active relative to the people available, available to do it. Um, sometimes we describe this as balancing demand against capability. And when we do this, we can see through that box where we're only allowed four pieces of work, the work flow nice and smoothly. But there are other kinds of balance. A quick question for you. Who here really likes the combination of uh, deadlines and interruptions? <laughs> Who likes to have lots of date-driven work and also to be running a support team at the same time? None of you like it. Um, who suffers from that daily, regularly? That is a lot of people. It's a very common, it's a very common problem. Um, and we suffer from uh, work with unnecessary dates, meaningless dates very often, or dates where we've chosen them to do within a particular time frame and haven't created the capacity or the capability to deal with the interruptions as well. That's a question of balance. But it's not just between the balance between fixed date work and interrupt work. It's the balance between those two kinds of work and other kinds of work, things, work that is merely urgency driven, work that doesn't have a date associated with it. It's just the sooner we deliver it, the better. And that actually describes most of the work that most of us does most of the time. Uh, and yet we treat it like it is either drop dead urgent or it's something that needs to be done by a particular date. There's also the work that's not so, it's so urgent, but still important, things like the improvements, the training, all these kind of intangible things that, that develop the capability of the team, develop the capability of the process. All those types of work and more, types of work that may be specific to your organization too, these need to be kept in balance. And we can get much better predictability out of our systems, out of our processes, if we can do this. Um, it's not necessary to organize the distractions away. You know, the idea that you, you divide your team into developers and people doing support um, is actually a very wasteful idea um, and often not the most humane approach either. Collaboration. Now, collaboration sometimes seems to mean to people being nice to each other. Um, it means something much more than that. Um, and I rather jokingly like to say it helps to think of collaboration as being a thing. It's a creative relationship. Um, who recognizes this collaboration? Most of you do. Perhaps we're showing our age. Um, so this is Lennon and McCartney. So this is a, a creative relationship. W were they happy people that were always nice to each other? Not really. Um, but they had a massive uh, impact 
on their particular domain, the world of popular music. Here's another creative relationship. This one is much more about solving problems. Uh, who recognizes this uh, pair of people? So this is, again, a collaboration. This is a thing. This is Watson and Crick, uh, the discoverers of the structure of, of DNA. So it's really helpful to think of, co of collaboration as being, it's a relational thing, and relationships between people that serve particular purposes to deliver things, to solve problems on behalf of the customer, and on the behalf of the organization, on behalf of the team, and so on. It's also a really good improvement fo focus. Now, a lot of my career has been as a manager, as a development manager. Um, for example, I was the dev manager of the global um, dev team uh, supporting one of the main investment banks' bond trading platform. And there was a surprise, shall I call it, that used to really annoy me. And the surprise was that a piece of work had been sat around for days, sometimes even weeks, hadn't been reviewed. And when it finally got reviewed, there were surprises inside it and, it, and more rework was needed. And is that a situation that, that people recognize? Um, some of you, have, I'm pleased to say, have engineered that problem away by using practices like pair programming. Um, but I came to realize that when... I'd see, when I encountered a nasty surprise, I should look for the failure in collaboration or the failure to collaborate. And that's a strategy that served me very well for ten, the last 10, 15 years in my management career. It's not, an, it's not a trick I originated, um, but I, cer I certainly learned it um, you know, under the influence of some of my, my more able managers as well. So collaboration is an improvement focus seeing a uh, lack of collaboration as a possible root cause for um, process dysfunction, for, uh, so particularly for surpri surprises. And if you can get into that root cause and expose it and encourage co a collaboration to happen, make, for example, in a code review relationship, both sides of that relationship responsible for the result in terms of both the quality and the timing, you will get a better and faster result most of the time. They're also the people that are just sort of left on the outside of the team and not involved. That might be their choice. I'm not, I'm not saying we should force everyone to collaborate, but if people are denied the opportunity to work in a collaborative way uh, where we are in the habit of throwing work over the fence, for example, or only talking to each other by email, um, you know, that's something we can do something about. Um, this is the small prints of the collaboration practice using models and the scientific, me scientific me method in the interest of time, I'm actually going to skip over this. Um, Michael and Simon this morning uh, did a really good talk on, on experiments. Um, so this is just about uh, using and building models and using the scientific method to provide some discipline around the experiments that we make. So that's sustainability, transparency, balance, and collaboration. And I have probably described the Kanban that most of you know and recognize. The question is, does it scale? Well, transparency has always scaled. I mean, since uh, well, for the last 100 years, we've used transparency, for example, uh, to uh, give a window on the financial performance of enterprises. You know, that's not a new idea. Um, the idea that we report on the status of projects and programs isn't a new idea. We've been doing that for um, as long as I can remember, probably longer. The idea of limiting work in progress at those kind of levels also that's perfectly doable. I mean, the idea that businesses should only run a limited number of business initiatives at a time is not a new idea, and it's an idea that's very successful. I, for a, for a year and a half, was the IT director of a medium-sized company, and when I joined the company, we discovered that we had more projects than there were people in the company. So just let that settle down for a minute, that thought. More projects than people in the company. I um, initiated uh, something to try and get that under control, and that was to um, try and align all those projects against business, business initiatives, give them, give them names, start to justify those initiatives, and we use a technique called A3, which some of you may have heard of. It's a, a, lean, a lean tool uh, to justify them. And then come to a decision with the management team as to which of these initiatives should, should get priority, which should be put on hold, which, which should, be, uh, should be killed. And a very, very surprising thing happened. Rather than me having to fight to close things down, I actually had a queue of people coming to me to offer to kill their projects for me. Um, that doesn't happen very often, 
Um, but it happens when a company that's addicted to work in progress suddenly realizes uh, that it's killing the company, that it, it's making it impossible to ever to actually finish anything. Um, so limiting work in progress at the, at the higher level, at the portfolio level, or even the enterprise level is something that we can do. The last one is collaboration. And this is actually a tricky one. I think collaboration on its own actually has a tendency to, to draw people together. That's a good thing. It's something we value when we're members of teams. Uh, but it can have some negative effects. Teams don't always talk to each other. They hide their information. You get them and us. You get competition between teams and so on. That's not inevitable. It doesn't always happen. But the best companies are the companies, I believe, the ones that have learned to have teams that work together effectively. How do you make that happen is the challenge. And to do that, I'm going to move on to the next group of three values. So sustainability is a very easy thing to understand at team level. Um, you can take your scrum practices and interpret them in the light of transparency, balance, and collaboration, for example. Service orientation is just give us a different way of looking at things that will help us understand how all this stuff can scale. This idea called a Kanban lens is something that uh, David Anderson um, developed in the last year or so. A way to view what you do now. So it's not, uh, we're not telling you to reorganize but just a different way of looking at the way things work in your organizations in three parts. The first one, creative work is service-oriented. Nothing stunning about that. Well, I think we're used to the idea that what we do things to deliver something to somebody else so that they can do something valuable with it, achieve something meaningful with it. Service delivery involves workflow. Usually something has to happen before something else happens, before we can finally get the thing out the door. Um, that's, that's understood to various levels of granularity in different organizations. Each organization, even each team, has its own workflow, but there is some kind of workflow there. And lastly, the special one, workflow involves a series of knowledge discovery activities. This is what makes knowledge work, like IT, like software development, product development, all sorts of other, other creative knowledge work endeavors. This is what makes them special. The work involves knowledge discovery. How many of you are familiar with the idea of your piece of work starting with just a few pieces of work, a few words on a post-it note? Yep. Some people prefer to receive a whole document before they start a piece of work. Some prefer just the, the, um, just the post-it note. I'm in the post-it note camp. Nothing wrong with, with needing a document. Um, but when you're starting with just a post-it note, note's worth of work, you've got some exploring to do just to find out what the requirement is, let alone being able to build something. And when the time comes to build something, you've got to work out whether you're actually capable of doing it, whether you have the tools to do it, the technologies to do it, and so on, whether your system is capable of supporting the kind of thing that's been asked for. And later we come to test it. This is where we discover whether we've done what we set out to do, but also whether it's any good for, for the eventual customer. Then we've got to discover whether we can actually release it or not. I mean, nine times out of 10, that's an easy thing. Sometimes it's not. Um, and finally, we need to discover whether the thing actually delivers value when the thing is out in, out in the wild, out in production. Lots of knowledge discovery. So we went from just a post-its notes worth of information to something actually working, delivering something meaningful and valuable to a customer or set of customers. This Kanban lens makes us look just differently at the, at the way organizations work. So, I'm just inviting you to look at your work in a view other than the functional organization of your company and other than the projects and programs of your company, more about how the work flows across the organization. So here, this is my version of the, uh, was it from, from golf course to cash we heard this morning. So at the golf, cor golf course end of the scale on the left, um, you know, we got the ideas just off the golf course um, they need a bit of, um, perhaps a bit of clarification, a little bit of um, examination, a little bit of filtering. What, it, what, what we're trying to do out of all of that, and Kanban's very good at this, is making sure that we have the right number of high quality and sufficiently well understood requirements for us to start building them. So it doesn't have to be an elaborate process, but we do need some kind of pro pro uh, process that gets the best stuff to the, to the front of the queue as quickly as possible. Then we need to build it, and we have teams to build, however organized, whether organized by projects or by feature teams or whatever, but a number of things are being built, possibly in parallel. 
And then we need to release, perhaps through a shared service, like, like a testing service, a deployment service, um, and so on. We release into production, and finally we have some happy customers receive what we've built. At the bottom, we've got various other shared services in the company, um, things like uh, infrastructure, for example, um, finance might be involved. Um, in my world where I'm working at the moment, um, security is an important um, stakeholder in the whole process. And some pieces of work just don't happen without the involvement and blessing of the security community. So two questions for you um, to just help, help this stuff work, help you make sense of this, help you improve things at scale. And the first question is, how can we better anticipate customer needs? So this is about the design of the knowledge discovery process. It's not about individual pieces of work necessarily. If that's too abstract for you, a second question. How soon will we know that we have met a customer need? Very simple idea. The idea of validating what it is we've, we've built. Now I first started experimenting in a really serious way with, with validation uh, was in about 2009. And I did it for all the wrong reasons. I, um, I did it because I was sick and tired of customers asking for things they didn't want. And I thought, I know how to stop this. After we delivered something, we'll have a conversation with the customer and we'll actually make sure that it was useful to them and we'll make sure that they're properly embarrassed if it isn't. Um, I wasn't quite as rude about that, but that was, that was pretty much the, uh, the, my, my thinking behind in introducing this um, validation step. And I was actually very humbled by the result. What actually happened was that if you're working backwards from that conversation, um, the, cu the customer and the developer had some good conversations about how to do those final implementation steps so that the customer would be ready to use it on day one, to use it effectively. They will be working together through in testing, making sure they were building the right thing. Uh, the customer will be looking over the shoulder of the developer during development and, and seeing how it's, how, it's, how it's going, making sure that there are questions being answered, all those kind of things. And so on and so on and so on, back through the process, the whole process, the collaborative work between the developer and the customer to ensure that that conversation at the end was going to be a happy one. So that was four or five years ago, a profound, humbling change for me. You know, I did something for all the wrong reasons, but got a spectacularly good result out of it. Um, I'm currently, um, three days a week, I'm the dev manager on a public sector project. Um, now, that might make your heart sink, but actually, it's, this project is a joy to work on. It's one of those rarities, a public sector project that is investing really, really heavily on understanding what the end user, that is the citizen in the street, that's the person that doesn't have broadband at home, who can only access the service through his mobile phone, or go to the library, or go to the job center. We're going out to meet these people, we're videoing them, we're watching people use the service in observation rooms, we're interviewing them afterwards to find out how it felt, not just what the problems were, but actually how it felt and what it means to them to use the service and so on. We're bringing videos of that experience back into the office so we can discuss them more and learn more about the customer. So we've taken feedback loops very, very seriously. We're not delivering on requirements. We are, we are focused all the time in every stage of our proce process of incorporating the feedback we're getting from, from the real end users. Again, a joy to work on. The third value, we've had, I've kind of put uh, customer focus and flow together in those last couple of slides. Uh, I'm going to address leadership directly, and I'm borrowing a, an idea uh, from Morton Hansen. He talks about T-shaped managers. I tend not to talk about managers because you get into the whole debate between what's the difference between a leader and a manager. And I actually think Leadership is open to all of us, whether we wear the special manager badge or the special manager hat or not. His idea is the idea of T-shaped managers, which are translated into T-shaped leadership. That's fostering collaboration within your teams, within your sphere of control, within your sphere of influence, but also making sure that there is effective collaboration crossways as well, between teams, between completely different parts of the organization even. Um, making sure that the process runs smoothly, making sure there's access to the right information that may exist in other parts of the organization and, and so on. Um, so that's, that's in a disciplined way, building networks to the right people that are going to help you achieve what you need in terms of improving the process or finding information. But it's not all about being the boss. I've shown just one big T here. 
Um, if you remember back to the, the start of this, uh, it was leadership at all levels, from, individual con from senior manager to individual contributor. It was the other way around. Um, and this is something that we've really had in Kanban from the beginning. Again, just referring to the front cover of the book. Um, I'm stuck. I'm too busy. I'm idle. Let's do something about it. How many acts of leadership are there there? Quick shout out. I'm really impressed, actually. The answers I'm hearing are four. Now, I usually get one. Let's do something about it. Um, the answer is it's between one and four, and it depends on context. And it depends on the intent of the person um, asking as well, or saying. But in some contexts, we've heard this today. I think it was in Phil's talk um, uh, just after lunch. Um, saying you're stuck, you don't understand something, can be a hard thing to do. But it actually may be you know, unsticking the whole project by being the one that sticks your hand up. Saying I'm too busy in some cultures is a badge of honor. Um, but also it may be a, a statement that actually we're doing this wrong. We haven't got balance. We're not balancing um, demand versus um, people, for example. Saying I'm idle. Now I was the, as I said, I was a de development manager in an investment bank. I was doing that in the period up to 2009, otherwise known to people in the banking community as the credit crunch. Um, and I can t promise you that was a very painful experience. And I can promise you that very few people would have put their hand up in 2009 and said, I'm idle. That would have been a brave thing to do, really. Let's do something about it. I think we can easily recognize that as an act of leadership. So that's service orientation, customer focus, flow, and leadership. And you can think of it as taking the, uh, the practices and the values of the sustainability agenda, uh, the ones that are very obvious how they apply at, at team level, and getting away from this problem of looking inwards as a team, but actually looking across, outwards and across, outwards to the customer, upstream and downstream in terms of the process as well. And leadership. Um, as a way not just of implementing it, but also as another um, objective, another purpose, um, you know, building the strength of the organization, building, the, building individuals as people um, to achieve this, you know, again, is something meaningful uh, for us to do. There's probably no better act of leadership than to encourage leadership in other people. So the last one. So if the service orientation was addressing a gap in sustainability, so that, you know, how do we scale the sustainability bit? Um, the gap that survivability is addressing is a more cultural one. Um, I'll just a quick sip of water again. Excuse me. So three words for you. Just checking the time. Excuse me. Um, bravado, complacency, and tampering. Now, if you're well read in terms of business books, you may recognize some of these words and associate them with particular authors. Um, so bravado comes from Good to Great by Jim Collins. Has any, any people in this room read, read that book? Good book. I really like it. It's, some people don't, but I really do. Um, so this is the idea um, where, uh, that, that managers overreach themselves. Um, they try and take the organization through a change that the organization isn't capable of sustaining. Um, and that has very negative effects at the organization, at the corporate level, and at the individual level. And um, you know, a number of corporate failures, even, you can put down to acts of bravado. Um, complacency was Russell Ackoff's word. Um, he, he said that the, the biggest sin of management was the sin of inaction and complacency. So that's not doing something when, when you should be doing something. Um, managers get criticized for doing things wrong. Uh, and therefore, the logic goes, I won't get criticized if I do nothing. Um, the last one, uh, who's, who's sort of Deming? W. Edwards, Edwards Deming, you know, the, the quality guru. Um, the, you know, you know, by, by some, some, some de definitions, you know, the founder of the quality movement. So he used this word tampering. And this is a, like the, the instinct of managers to, to intervene every time something's not quite right. Um, he, has, he has a game uh, or a number of, a number of games to, to demonstrate this and to show that actually it worsens performance rather than improves it. In corporate life, in knowledge work, you know, we sometimes see this as uh, the manager saying, oh, this must never happen again. Therefore, we need a new policy to make sure it never happens again. 
And what you end up with is just burdened under the weight of all those, all those policies. Policies that will apply once in 100 years, but you're paying the cost of them all the time. If you can't remember bravado, complacency, and tampering, try too fast, too slow, or too random. Right, the J-curve. This is the J-curve. This is um, often attributed to um, Virginia Satir, the Satir J-curve. Um, strictly speaking, you know, the other people other than her have used this model. Um, but, you know, hers is, hers is a good description. And it's the idea that things get worse before they get better when you make any kind of change. Um, and there's a whole load of psychology that goes, goes um, into it. You know, the resistance that people feel uh, to change before the change even happens. Um, the fact that people often prefer the familiar to what's better. All sorts of strange things happen around change. But when we're talking about safety, we can talk about whether the depth of change is sustainable from a safety point of view, from the point of view of the safety of the organization, from the point of view of the comfort and safety of the people in the organization. And we can talk about how long it takes as well. Um, as we said, change can be so brutal that it inflicts pain just because of the speed of it or the thoughtlessness of it. But also, we can do it too slowly and it takes too long. Um, if your organization's um, patience for change is nine months, say, and you're, and you're embarking on a change program that's only going to deliver measurable benefit in a year, you run the very high risk that the organization will lose patience before the uh, project finishes and the change agent gets fired or, or promoted out of the way. Um, the, the initiative gets disbanded and the organization tries something else. I mean, organizations that go through continual change, never achieving it, is something sometimes for this reason. So an alternative to that is to make your J's much smaller to do things incrementally. Um, uh, small J's and then building up a capability for change. Um, we talk about evolutionary change and I think um, one of the subtleties that, that, that makes incremental change into evolutionary change is that we're clear about that we are striving for fitness. That means some idea of what better looks like or some, some kind of true north to, to navigate towards is one model for it, um, but some measure of fitness, whether that's financial, whether that's to do with the well-being well of uh, the people in the organization, the satisfaction of the customers, or some sort of blended combination of, of all of those. Um, and this, again, takes us back to experiments. Does our experiment um, deliver something that we would all agree, uncontroversially, relative to our fitness criteria or our true north, something that's definitely taking us in the, in the right direction? That doesn't mean we need to know what the final solution looks like. We just need to know um, that we are moving through changes um, that are delivering benefit and that we are, and that are delivered in such a way um, that they're sustainable, that they're safe. So two questions, really, just to, to help concentrate that. How can we bring opportunities for positive change to the surface? So there's two parts to that. Um, I've talked about the idea of the fitness function or the true north already. Um, so that's how we know that the change is actually positive. We're not just randomly changing, um, uh, trying different things every week until something sticks. Also, how do we bring change change to the surface or the need to change to the surface. And this kind of is the strategy behind Kanban in the first place. We're all about making things visible. And it's actually a good idea to make the, the pain visible in some way, either the symptoms of pain or the root causes of pain. So if, for example, you have a problem that you never have visibility of the pipeline, that's easy. Make it visible. Put it on the board. Um, if that involves conversations with um, your customers or with your portfolio managers or whatever to do that, let's do that. Not only do we make it visible, but we'll probably find better ways of managing it in the process. So you have problems with dependencies between teams. It's a very common problem. Um, for, for me, in many of my roles, the problem has been dependencies on infrastructure teams. Not the infrastructure teams were doing anything wrong, anything bad, but they weren't, the, they weren't exclusively serving us. They were serving lots of other projects in parallel. We had to wait our, our turn in the queue. Um, again, making that problem visible, making the impact of it visible, means that they and us will make better decisions. It may actually be quite right that we're waiting in turn. You know, if my project is to improve the cafeteria website, you know, I, I should wait my turn behind the change that benefits the, you know, the trading system 
or, or the, one of the, com the company's core risk management systems or, or whatever it might be. But it's very possible that the opposite is happening. If that team was servicing um, requests only on a first-come, first-served basis, we may easily find that they are servicing the cafeteria website before something of, of um, you know, much higher value to the organization. So bring those pain points to the surface somehow. Um, do it in a way that's respectful of other people, clearly. But do it in a way that's going to help build agreement uh, that, uh, that change needs to happen and then agreement on what the actual details of the change need to be. And that's what, a lot of what this survivability agenda is about, is making sure that change is conducted with understanding, agreement, and respect. Understanding what the problem is, understanding in particular of where we are and how we can go about changing it. Making sure that change is done on the basis of agreement. If your change is done by the people impacted by the problem and are going to have to carry the change out, um, rather than just directed from above, um, it's much more likely to stick, much more likely to succeed. It's much more likely to be designed by people who understand what the impact is going to be, so on and so on and so on. And related to that is respect. Respecting people for who they are and what they contribute and for the journey that they've already been through to get here. Respecting the same for the organization. You've survived this long, you can't be doing it all bad. And it's kind of the opposite of the, and it's very stereotypical and very unfair, but it's, it's the opposite of the change agent going into the organization and saying um, their first sentence they utter is, we don't need project managers anymore. A statement like that is going gonna, is gonna to generate a negative reaction. You don't need that. Um, you can generate change actually without confronting people's roles, people's personal identity. You know, that's something that's very dearly and deeply held by, by people. Um, Kanban's focus is on the work. Uh, primarily um, on the flow of work, on the, on the deliver, delivery of meaningful value to the customer, and so on. Uh, if people can see that, and they can see that the way the work is organized, that the way people are, is organized, uh, see that the practices aren't right, so on and so on and so on, they, they, in most cases, will be ready, willing to change, in fact, to even to suggest the changes that, that need to happen. Uh, so, respect as a test as, as well as a strategy. And this is the cultural challenge really of Kanban. Could you, can you imagine your organization working such that all change was conducted with understanding, agreement, and respect? And that's something you can start just at your team level, but it's something you can start expecting of your managers. And, and maybe just that cultural challenge will be something that catalyzes something, something exciting. I'm We've reached quarter past. Just to summarize, so Kanban is the humane, start with what to do now, approach to change. I hope you understand some of the humanity in the values that I've described. Uh, you've seen what start with what you do now means. Um, and you've seen also Kanban described in these terms of uh, nine values, three agendas. You see that some of them directly speak to scale. Some of them need help in order to scale. Some of them aren't about scale at all. Understanding agreement and respect works at every possible level. They're completely scale-free. Um, but if you can introduce them in the right place in your organization, it may make some very helpful changes for you. That's me done. Um, there are some references if you want to read them and some thank yous, but I'll leave you with that slide. Thank you. I don't know whether I want to take questions from the floor or just mingle afterwards. Um, Either's fine by me.